KJ Muto, aka The Great Muta, is retiring from professional wrestling in around 12 hours. No, literally, his final match is tomorrow. So today, we're going to commemorate one of the longest, most decorated, and definitely weirdest runs in wrestling history. I'm Andy from What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 things you need to know about the Great Muta. Number 10. The gimmick originated in the United States. If you're a Western wrestling fan, you probably know more about the Great Muta than KG Muto, because the bulk of the stuff that he did in the US, WCW and the NWA, was under the Great Muta gimmick. But he also originated this character in that country, not his native Japan, as well. Muto first became the Great Muta in 1989. He was in WCW slash the NWA at the time and Gary Hart was his manager. He was closely associated with the Great Kabuki, who in storyline terms was his dad. Basically, and the character essentially took a bunch of long, tired, and just abused tropes about Japanese wrestlers and crafted them into something new. But more about those tropes in just a little bit. Under the guise of the Great Muta, Muto developed a crueler working style, a mysterious aura, and worked at a frenetic pace unlike anything US crowds had seen before, not taking the gimmick over to Japan until 1990. Number 9. His talents weren't immediately recognised. Before the Great Muta, there was Super Black Ninja in 1988, and before that, there was the White Ninja in 1986. Both of these characters were extremely one-dimensional and cliché, preventing Keiji Muto from showing his best work to US audiences, and audiences anywhere really, until he became the Great Muta in 1989, when he started blowing minds and legitimately changing the game. Once Muta got away from his ninja days, from that tired, worn-out nonsense, even in 1989, he absolutely erupted. He drove American fans in particular into awestruck frenzies, and it's a lesson you'd think that American pro wrestling bookers would have learned. Maybe we don't book the Japanese star like some stupid one-dimensional facade. And yet, it's a mistake that they kept on making years and years and years into the future. Actually, when you think about it, the situation is not too dissimilar to the fate that befell Kazuchika Okada when he first worked for TNA before returning to New Japan and becoming a major, major star. Nonetheless, the Great Muta was extremely successful in those early days in the US, across the NWA, where he feuded extensively with Sting in perhaps one of the most underrated wrestling rivalries of all time. We just had to get through two bloody ninja gimmicks to get there. Number 8. Modern wrestling would be unrecognisable without him. In terms of in-ring innovations that Muta brought to the table, Shining Wizard? I mean, how much more do I really need to say about that move? That concussive basement knee strike that he adapted somewhat later in his career as he adapted to a less explosive, less eruptive working style because after a couple of years in the business, this guy's knees were effectively sawdust. And yet he's still going in 2023. Regardless, The Shining Wizard is everywhere, even today. Countless wrestlers have kind of ripped it off to a degree or paid tribute, however you want to put it. Barely a show passes without somebody hitting it. And it's because the Great Muta came up with it. And on a similar note, let's talk about the Moonsault and the Dragon Screw Leg Whip. Muto invented neither of these, but he certainly popularized the Moonsault and brought the Dragon Screw back to a great degree of prominence before it was kind of taken over a little bit by Hiroshi Tanahashi, who, lest we forget, saved New Japan with that as one of his core weapons. And the Moonsault is one of the most frequently used high-flying moves in the game still today. Even in this era of seven rotation shooting star screw flip dive bombs or whatever, whatever, it's hard to beat a good Moonsault and Muto had one of the best. Low arcing and snapping, it was as if he was thrashing himself down on you from the top rope rather than gliding gracefully. A great execution and poison mist. Come on, it's everywhere too as well. Another thing that he popularized, he brought into this higher level of consciousness, at least among American fans. And you look at TV today, you've got Asuka, you've got various others. It's great stuff, it's timeless stuff. Number seven, he is a huge draw. 
Keiji Muto is one of the biggest pro wrestling draws of all time. And to illustrate that, let's go through some numbers here. In the 1990s, a real peak period for Japanese pro wrestling, he drew no fewer than seven houses of 50,000 fans or over. One of these came on the 9th of October 1995. It was New Japan Pro Wrestling versus the UWFI. The height of that feud, it was Muto versus Nobuhiro Takeda. And for their match, 67,000 fans, a gate of $6.1 million for that era, the second highest ever. Sensational stuff. Later on in his run, Muto drew a crowd of 55,000 for a main event match with Kensuke Sasaki. Now to contextualize all of this, um, to put these numbers just into a bit of perspective, Japanese wrestling was popping at the time. All Japan was the peak promotion, of course, for many, many people, the indomitable four pillars of that company, still regarded as some of the greatest pro wrestlers of all time. And so they should be, in a business sense and an art sense. But even the UWFI, which you know was never the undisputed top promotion in Japan, well, they were able to draw a 46,000 person house for a card with Vader versus Takeda on the top. And yet amongst all of these bumper houses, amongst these tens of thousands of people showing up to watch these matches every single week and month and whatever, whatever, Muto was the drawing king. Number six, his comeback story is better than anybody's. Keiji Muto's knees are made of sawdust. You know all about it today, of course, when he's doing interviews and he's seen on camera moving around in a wheelchair ahead of his final match with Tetsuya Naito. But this actually goes back decades. It turns out when you work such an intense, frenetic, dynamic style, it takes a toll on your body. And this guy has had to make several comebacks, reinventing himself as Keiji Muto, as the great Muto, and sometimes a balance between the two to compensate. Slowing down, changing his style, mixing things up, and ensuring that he stays relevant. It was true in 2001 when he could genuinely be considered the best, perhaps outright wrestler on the planet. And again, in like 2008, when he was absolutely great as well. To contextualize that in a kind of US way, think of Shawn Michaels having two similar tier comeback runs rather than just the one. That's how much of a success this guy has been at doing it over the years. And Yes, his work in this era has been kind of selfish, maybe a little bit political, but that doesn't take away from the other times. Number five, his vast influence over American wrestling. Muto definitely wasn't the first wrestler to ever kind of chop and change and flip flop between two different wrestling personas as the situation demanded it. But he was definitely the most famous, bringing in the great Muta gimmick when certain feuds and storylines demanded it. This was also quite a clever way of circumventing the rigors of age, the wear and tear of actively participating in pro wrestling. He could flip gimmicks over to the great Muta and rely on shtick a little bit more than dynamism under his real name. But it's also quite interesting to consider how these different characters have been perceived on different sides of the Pacific. In the US, he's considered kind of a work rate phenom, but over in Japan, when he flipped to the great Muta, his work was considered a step or two down from his early days as Keiji Muto. And you need only look at examples like the Free Faces of Foley or Finn Balor and his demon to scratch the surface when it comes to examples of other wrestlers who've worked multiple personas at once. That is a lengthy list that we could probably fill our own video with. Uh, and it speaks volumes of Muto's influence. Number four, the circumstances behind his New Japan departure. Keiji Muto was a New Japan guy in a culture built on loyalty. Promotional jumps like happen in the US quite frequently, particularly during the 90s, uh, just weren't really that much of a thing in Japan. You were a company guy through and through. You generally stuck with the company that brought you into the game. That was certainly the case for Muto all the way through the 90s and into the early 2000s when Inokiism kicked in. This was, of course, Antonio Inoki, rest in peace, and his misguided attempts at portraying pro wrestling as a serious martial art akin to MMA, and it brought all kinds of failed experiments from forcing New Japan wrestlers to go over into Pride FC and work actual MMA fights in which they were absolutely schooled, to bringing in mixed martial artists for pro wrestling shows in New Japan, which had mixed results. Misguided is definitely the word for this. Inokiism sadly almost drove New Japan Pro Wrestling out of business and it drove Muto 
out of the company. Appalled by what was going on in this company, in this just MMA styled remake that wasn't salvaged until a guy called Hiroshi Tanahashi came along, Muto left the company, went over to All Japan, one of the closest competitors at the time, where he eventually became president. Not of the country, of the company. Number three, his second US excursion was a lot worse than the first. It's 1989 when Keiji Muto first rocked up in the NWA slash WCW as the Great Muto. Great game-changing times, opposite Sting, blowing minds with a completely unique character and style of wrestling American fans had never seen before. But when he returned to WCW in 2000, the problem was that he was returning to WCW in 2000. He was kicking about with the Young Dragons now, working handicap matches in which he inexplicably lost, and he was part of the two in two on one. He was getting jobbed out to Tank Abbott in 45 seconds. It was a complete stinker of a run compared to what had come before. And while Muto has never said as much, you can't imagine he'd have been too happy with how things had went down. Then again, the guy does have a penchant for not always working his hardest, particularly in his latter years, enjoying a bit of a coasting period on many an occasion throughout his career, so who knows, maybe he saw it as some kind of holiday. Either way, it was pretty crappy viewing, and that's what we've judged it on here. Number two, the context behind the Muta scale. If you're a pro wrestling fan who's been watching for longer than like a couple of weeks, you probably know what the Muta scale is. If not, it's a terrifying gusher of a blade job gone awry. Blood everywhere, gross stuff. You know the drill. But the thing about the Muta scale is that it was almost the Hase scale. So to rewind just a little bit, Great Muta and Hiroshi Hase had this match in uh, December, 1992. That's when Muta bled buckets. That's when the term was coined and is still in use to this day. But they actually ran an angle uh, in 1990, September 1990, where they had another singles match, another bloodbath, where it was Hiroshi Hase who was taking the gusher. He was a little bit too eager in that blade job of his as his head collided with the post and he wanted to simulate the blood loss. And oh boy, that stringy crimson mask was a sight to behold. It just so happens that the Hase scale never caught on. It was two years later that the Muta scale did. And of course, we've seen plenty of examples of this in the modern era as well. Hello, Dustin Rhodes, double or nothing, 2019. Ugh. And at number one, this is one of the craziest wrestling retirement tours ever. Retirements are a difficult subject in pro wrestling. Rarely do they stick, and even if they do, they're usually pretty complex, weird, crazy, all over the place, and indeed elaborate. But this one might be one of the wackiest of them all. It's pretty damn carny, actually, so... <laughs> Let's just go through what exactly Keiji Muto has done to get to this point. On the 1st of January, he had his last singles match as the Great Muta opposite Shinsuke Nakamura of WWE. Then three days later, on the 4th of January, he worked his last New Japan match at Wrestle Kingdom 17. Then, on the 22nd of January, he teamed with Darby Allin and Sting at the final Bye Bye show for his last match as the Great Muta. Muta. So that means when he wrestles Tetsuya Naito tomorrow for Pro Wrestling Noah, it won't be his last match. It'll technically be his last, 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 last Pro Wrestling match after all of this. It's a tour as elaborate and zany as the man himself made even wackier when you consider that Muto recently claimed that his first choice for an opponent was not Tetsuya Naito, despite being one of the most popular wrestlers in the world. It was The Rock. There you go. How could you make this crazy situation even wilder? But if you want to check that match out, and I totally recommend you do, it is genuinely end of an era for one of the most decorated stars in Japanese wrestling history. Live on Wrestle Universe tomorrow, 21st of February. Him and Naito. You also have the small matter of some guy called Kazuchika Okada facing Kaito Kiyomiya just below it. So it's going to be a great show. I'll be tuning in. You should too. Anyway. Thanks for joining me for this video. You can like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell. All of that stuff. And let us know what you thought in the comment section as well. Then you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE. You can follow myself at Andy H. Murray. Where the H stands for Hiroshi Dahase, I guess. It was his scale all along. Damn you, Muta. Bye.